This is Breakthroughs. I'm Erin Spain, Communications Director at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. As an undergraduate, Dr. Elizabeth McNally spent a summer in a lab trying to identify mutations in the genes of patients with muscle disease. Now she's developing novel therapies to treat such diseases. Dr. McNally is a human geneticist, a Northwestern medicine cardiologist, and the director of the Center for Genetic Medicine here at Northwestern. She joins us today to talk about her recent discoveries in the genetics of cardiovascular and neuromuscular disorders and to chat about what we can expect in the next few years in the field of genetic medicine. Thank you so much for being here today. Happy to be here. Tell me a little bit about that first summer in a lab as an undergrad. Um, It was a little foretelling that experience to where you are today. Tell tell me about that. Well, it was the very early days of molecular biology, and I'll I'll be very much dating myself, but to tell you it was what we call the pre-PCR era. So polymerase chain reaction, PCR, is a very critical step for us in human genetics because it enabled us to actually obtain DNA within hours and in quantities that we never could before. And so that's what really launched the field of human genetics. And so you can imagine pre-PCR was pretty difficult to be able to actually do any type of genetic assessment. And at the time, we could look at, you know, one one billionth of the genome, which obviously not very much. Um, And then you fast forward to where we are now, where I can see a patient in clinic and we can do a genetic test or even sequence their whole genome and build stem cell models of their disease. So so we've come quite a ways. And that first lab you were in was studying muscle disorders. Yes. And that's still what you're studying today. Yeah. So that must have been a very influential lab to yeah, be in. Yeah, it was um, amazing. We had just identified the genes that are important for the muscle protein known as myosin, which is actually the motor protein within muscles and the motor protein within hearts that actually make contraction happen. And so we drew blood samples from uh, children with different forms of muscle disease, not knowing what any of it was and trying to see whether the myosin genes were involved in that at all. Now, of course, we weren't too successful because what it turned out was that the myosin genes are actually involved in a disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it took about 10 more years to figure that out. And again, those are now patients that I see routinely in my clinic. So share with me some of these breakthroughs that you've made in recent years for patients. Um, specifically, you made some major breakthroughs for patients with uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and other muscle wasting diseases. Yeah, so what we do clinically is we we follow people who have genetic diseases and as you can gather if it's a genetic disease odds are their family members probably also are similarly affected. And so um, one of the things we noticed very early on was that even though people in the family might share the same genetic mutation, the way that mutation expresses itself from person to person can be quite different and we and we envisioned that that was under the control of other genetics or what we call genetic modifiers. And so we spent the last 15 years identifying genetic modifiers and our rationale on that is it's nature's way of saying, well, how did we make this disease not quite as bad as it would be otherwise? So those we call those suppressive modifiers that actually make it better. And so if you can identify those, then you can in in principle come up with pathways you can then exploit therapeutically. And that's what we've been doing. And specifically that disease, you work with some very young patients. Yeah. We do. And it's um, always a challenge because we work with people really across the lifespan. Genetics, we're born with our genetic code, but the time frame in which a disease may show up can be quite variable. Some diseases have onset in childhood. Um, to be honest, most of my patients are actually young adults. We, we get very busy around Christmas time. We've got a lot of people home from, from college and different things like that. But I think the message we've learned loud and clear over all the years is that you can live with these genetic diseases. Some are worse than others, and those are the ones we're pretty motivated about trying to find new therapy. But um, everybody's got a little something in their genome. Well, a recent study you published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation identified a protein that can enhance the repair of acute muscle injuries by more than 50% and mouse models. Now, this is still pretty new research, but why is a finding like that so exciting when thinking about these patients that you're treating? So it really it gets back to the identifying genetic modifiers. So about five years ago, we had identified a genetic modifier called Anexin A6. And Anexin A6 turns out to be the protein that if I poke a hole in the side of a muscle, it is what goes right to the site and reseals that hole. It's what we call a molecular band-aid. So it 
fixes the problem. And so we began to think about it. In this work, I have to give all credit to Alexis de Monbrun, who's the scientist who's been driving all of this research. Alexis had the fabulous idea of, well, if it can fix it from the inside of the cell, maybe you can add it from the outside of the cell and similarly fix the problem. And so she actually started looking at what happens when you add extra annexin, and it turns out it very effectively reseals an injured muscle. I will add that in muscular dystrophy, it's a lot like injury, what happens to okay. the muscle. Only you know, you know, all those people who ran the marathon yesterday, their muscles are all really sore today, and in fact, leaking a little bit because they ran 26 miles. But luckily, they're going to lay low for the next week or two, and things will heal up through the own, their own natural processes. In muscular dystrophy, what happens is that injury is happening all the time and the muscles never get a chance to reseal. And so we thought if we could do something to help it seal and correct itself faster, that that would actually be useful for treating the disease. And this does sound like a very exciting finding, and it's made possible through a really interesting collaboration that Northwestern has, the funding, um, Lakeside Discovery. Tell me a little bit about Lakeside Discovery and how it's um, helped helped you do some of this work. So Lakeside Discovery is a, is a new entity. It, it comes from Deerfield Investments, and Deerfield Investments is taking a very different approach towards drug development. Deerfield has looked across the spectrum and, and really recognized that there's a lot of really good ideas in academia in universities, but not necessarily the knowledge about how to move that into drug development. And so what they've done is they've partnered now with five different academic institutions, Northwestern being one of them, and they want to find exactly those ideas where something has happened in an academic laboratory that really could be developed into a therapeutic. So I will say all the beginning part of this work was actually funded by the NIH, okay. um, and that's how we got started on it. But then Deerfield, through this entity now created and called Le uh, Lakeside Discovery, um, selected our project for one that they thought could be advanced. So now we're working very closely with Lakeside. We've made the initial observations, and the next step is how do we begin the process of developing that observation into a drug? So we will be watching that very closely. Yeah, it's, it's quite exciting. I mean, as a physician and a scientist, this is what we spend our lives doing, which is hopefully discovering something that we can turn into something that makes somebody's lives better. Um, you know, as, as scientists, we often understand why something doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to. But as physicians, it's our job also to fix it. Well, in the field of genetic medicine, it's just changing so rapidly. It seems like there's always headlines coming out, new discoveries being made. There's also a lot of concerns out there right now um, with genetic medicine, home DNA kits, um, CRISPR gene editing of human embryos, such as the case in China, which resulted in live births. So how do you and your colleagues address these kind of concerns? You're out here, you're doing this research, you're working on new cures, and then there's this other part of the the world of genetic medicine. How do you how do you respond to the the stories out there? I mean, it's definitely a very personal process, and with that, all the concerns around privacy and protections are there. Um, what's interesting is we've seen just a massive advance in the in human genetics, in part because we now have the technology to readily and rapidly determine someone's DNA code. Um, and we've gotten a number of surprises along the way in doing that. First, I think we uncovered that there's just a lot more difference between any two people than what we ever imagined. We always knew people were different from each other, but it turns out there's a lot more difference. There's five million differences between any two people. And the nature of those differences are that they're actually quite rare in the population. So we're each really quite unique, um, which I think is great, and um, but yet a challenge for medicine always <laughs> right. at the same time. Um, the other thing that we've learned is that the general public has a huge appetite for wanting to learn more about DNA, and I think we see that, and I think this year it's estimated that something like 30 million people have participated in some form of genetic assessment, and the vast majority of that is through companies where they will tell you about your genetic ancestry um, and things along those lines, and possibly with a little bit of medical guidance. Guidance, I might call that. And that's distinct from there are now also a number of commercial testing companies that if you want to get a medical genetic test, right. say your family yeah. has a history of breast cancer or colon cancer or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, those tests are now readily available in a way that they weren't before. In the past, they were very, very costly, but now they've come down quite a lot in pricing and they've become much more available. The challenge is, is that a lot of our um, providers, our healthcare providers, physicians and nurses alike, haven't necessarily been trained in how to interpret this testing, how to order it, how to interpret it. And that's where we rely very heavily on our genetic counselors to take on that role. 
I do want to talk about genetic counseling actually within uh, your center is the genetic counseling program. It's a master's program at Northwestern. Why is it important to be training this new generation of genetic counselors? It wasn't a field that was very large even 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, it's it's still undersized for yeah. the need that is out there. Again, 30 million people participating in some type of genetic assessment. We know genetic information has a lot of capacity to help us predict what things we might be at risk for in our life. And importantly, there's a lot of ways we manage that risk. So we've seen some increase in the number of genetic counseling programs here at Northwestern. We have one of the oldest and I personally think the very best in the country. Yes. Um, and we've expanded our program, um, not quite doubling it in size, but a little bit less than that. And it's under the guidance of Kathy Wickland, who's a tremendous genetic counselor and educator and really a, a, um, a national and international um, expert in the topic. So, um, so we're very aware of that. Our counselors have done very well. They're all getting hired into fabulous places as soon as they leave here. Um, but it's, it's an absolutely growing area, and we're, we're doing our best to keep up with that need. And through the center, you talked about some of the technology that's available. So you have programs, you have um, academic programs, but you are also, you have the CRISPR technology. Yes. And that is being used quite a bit here at Feinberg now. Tell me about that. Yeah, so gene editing, or, or CRISPR, which is what it's known as, is giving us, for the first time, the capacity to go in and really make very site-specific changes in the genome. And so, of course, you can think that through. Like, if you can go in and make that change, well, then that starts to open up the possibility of being able to fix genetic mutations. We're still a ways away, not not as far as you might think, but a bit a ways away from doing that in people. Where we're using it all the time in the research laboratory is to make useful cell lines that model human diseases. And so there's been, again, a couple of really amazing discoveries, the ability to make stem cells from people. So I can do that from your skin cells, from your blood cells, or even from the cells in your urine, which is where we do this from a lot. And we can turn those into stem cells in a dish. We can then do a couple of more molecular tricks and turn those into heart cells in a dish. And it's amazing yeah. to see beating cells in a dish. Um, but now we can go in and do gene editing and make the kind of model we want, or in some cases, is actually test the capacity to correct a given mutation that's present there. And so we're doing this very regularly and thinking ahead. This is, becomes our practice platform for being able to test doing it in people one day. Well, you said we're not as far away as we think. So yeah. how far away are we from doing something like, um, you know, taking a genome editing virus and injecting it into someone? So um, so for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a disorder I spend a lot of time thinking about and taking care of patients who have this devastating disorder, I think it's really um, going to be one of the first cases where we see what we call systemic gene editing being done, where we actually inject a virus and it's carrying the CRISPR-Cas9 and it's going to actually bring it right to the muscles of those patients and co correct them on site. Um, it's already been done in large animal models, so that tells yeah. you we're not that far from doing it in people. But there are, of course, a lot of questions. There are questions about how safe it is. Do we know that it's only going to hit the site we want it to hit? Do we know that it's um, not going to cause other problems? And so there's still much that has to be done about the safety. And then one of the challenges right now is that our best delivery mechanism for that is using a virus. Right. And there's um, not enough capacity to make enough of these yeah. viruses right now. And even looking at that, I don't know that long-term viruses are going to be the way that we do this. In the near term, that's for sure what we will do. But long term, we may have to come up with some other ways besides viruses in terms of how to deliver this machinery into the cells. In that case, in China, using the CRISPR gene editing of human embryos, that created a lot of headlines. And there's a lot of questions out there about ethics when it comes to using this technology. Well, and as there should be. I mean, these are... Um, really important questions to be asking. And I think it's pretty clear from that case in China that, you know, not only was this scientific community just taken aback by that process, but the public and the government, and I think everybody shared that same concern, and he was pretty widely condemned for that activity. So I think that's led to a number of decisions and recommendations on the part of a lot of scientists and governments, which is that we really need to do this very carefully going forward. Um, anything where we would change what's called the germline 
line, meaning the sperm or the eggs or something that would change that future generation, um, there's really a, a moratorium on doing that right now. And I think one thing that is important is that as we think about actually treating a child with a really devastating genetic disease, we have to balance that. We want to be able to do what we can do to take care of people. And if we can treat a genetic disease, we want to be able to do that. But at the same time, we do need to be sensitive about the possibility of changing future generations. So I do think we spend a lot of time thinking about it, talking about it, getting ethical advice. Um, my one really strong opinion in this is that we don't forget about the patient's voices. And so we have to make sure that they're part of the conversation as well. So we've talked quite a bit about the muscular dystrophy and the, the patients that you treat there, but you actually treat a wide variety of patients uh, through your work as director of the cardiovascular genetics program at the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute. Tell me about some of the other rare diseases that you encounter there. So we do the broad spectrum of cardiovascular genetics. A lot of our patients have different forms of heart failure or what we call cardiomyopathy. So that's abnormalities in the heart muscle itself. So you see there's a lot of tie between the skeletal muscle and the heart muscle. Yeah. We learn a lot from studying both. Um, we see lots of people with different forms of aortic diseases where their aorta is affected with a gene mutation that can affect the, them and cause them to have a risk for dissecting or rupturing their aortas. As you can imagine, that's a pretty devastating yeah. disorder. The aorta is the major blood vessel of the body, and if that ruptures, it's life-threatening. Um, and we're used to thinking of families and patients with Marfan syndrome is one of the examples of that, but we actually know there's many more genes than just that gene. We also know that there are a lot of genetic forms of irregular heart rhythms that run in families. So we do a lot there. And then, of course, neuromuscular disease is an area. But there's also forms of hypercholesterolemia that run in families right. and many other examples. Well, and when you bring the patients in, sometimes you're dealing with a whole room of people yes. because everyone <laughs> in the family is wondering, do I have this as well? Or, Correct. Right. So once we find a mutation for a family, um, that's an incredibly powerful tool to have for the family. We found then a tag for their disease. And then for every other member of that family, we simply just test for that little tag. Either you have it or you don't. Um, and that can be very helpful at knowing who in the family has to keep coming to the doctor and get checked right. out from time to time and who in the family kind of, you know, gets to get out of jail free and not necessarily need to come back and keep seeing us. But you've correctly identified that for every person we see, we are very much connected to their family members. I have to imagine the, the patients that you come across, you sort of bring their stories back to the lab with you and it must be an inspiration. Indeed. So we, we don't even just bring their stories back to the lab. We often bring their cells back to the lab, too. So we, so many of the patients and the families that we see, you know, these are often families that have known something. They've had something in their family. They've been the only person that's lived to that age in their family because some of these have risks of dying suddenly. Um, and so when we can first just tell them we've figured out what the problem is, that's that's so helpful to them to know that and gives lots of them peace of mind to know that they now have a diagnosis. But then the next thing they want to do is say, well, how do I fix this? How do we, how do we go about thinking about developing a cure for our disease? Um, and that's where being able to make stem cell lines from them and being able to do gene editing is incredibly helpful for them. And so my trainees, whether they're PhD students or MD students or postdoctoral fellows, um, they're very much involved in, in all the patients we take care of. And something else that's just pretty cool about your labs, you have a lot of trainees yep. coming through. But that's our job. You know, that's our job. We're here in an academic environment in a university. And so it isn't our, our job just to do really good science, yeah. but it's also to train the next generation of scientists. And that's what we take very seriously here. And tell me a little bit about what we can expect from that next generation. Some of the people that you're bringing through are doing some incredible work. Um, yes, indeed. I'm so proud of all my trainees. They, they are just doing great science and really advancing the cause and everything we discover, of course, there's 10 more questions after that. So I'm just incredibly pleased that there are um, really good scientists coming up in the system that I know we've trained very well and that are going to be able to ask these questions. Watching the technology grow in the way that it has and imagining, I mean, I know what I've seen in my decades of doing science, but I'm excited for what they'll see in their decades of doing science. Well, we are excited to see it, too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth McNally, for coming on and talking a little bit about your research and sharing it with our audience. I thank you. Great. Thank you. You can now claim continuing medical education credit just by listening. Go to our website, feinberg.northwestern.edu, and search CME.